EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, presents the beatification of Michael McGivney, founder of the Knights of Columbus. I'm Brian Patrick, along with Dr. Matthew Bunsen and Father Raymond D'Souza, Skyping with us from Ontario, Canada. So, Matthew, what we're about to witness from the Cathedral of St. Joseph in Hartford, Connecticut, is actually called the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and Rite of Beatification. What does that mean, and where does beatification come into the Mass? Well, basically what this is, is the official event uh, for the declaration by Pope Francis uh, that Michael McGivney is going to be declared blessed. Uh, this takes place within the Mass. We will have the introductory rites and then go right into the rite of beatification. That includes the request by Archbishop Blair, a uh, petition similar to what we have with the rite for canonizations. Uh, but then we also have a, a reading of a brief biography, I believe by Carl Anderson, and then uh, the reading of the official letter, an apostolic letter from Pope Francis. Uh, that is sort of the official decree at that point. Uh, he is blessed. Then we also have the presentation of the relic of uh, blessed Michael McGivney, uh, and uh, there's going to be a special treat in terms of that uh, as to who will process with the relic. Uh, and then we also have the unveiling of the image. When all of that is done, uh, we then go right back into the Mass. And uh, that is a very important message uh, because the, the Mass itself is the source and summit uh, for us. And the Mass itself then uh, is the heart of what we're trying to do as a people. And so we always nest beatifications and canonizations within the Mass. The other thing to pay attention to in this apostolic letter uh, is the statement of the feast day uh, for Michael McGivney. And uh, that is August the 13th. Now he was born on August 12th, died on August 14th. Uh, the choice of the 13th is uh, significant uh, because uh, the 14th, as, as Father D'Souza has pointed out in a recent piece that I encourage everyone to read at the National Catholic Register, ncregister.com, uh, is the feast day of Maximilian Kolbe. And I, I know that Father can talk more about that. So the 13th is sort of sandwiched perfectly between the day that McGivney was born and the day that he died, or as we say, his birthday in heaven. Father D'Souza, talk for a moment about the presider for today's Mass, and why is that so significant? Well, the, that apostolic letter that Matthew mentioned is going to be read by Cardinal Tobin, Joseph Tobin, the Archbishop of Newark. He's an American cardinal. He's been delegated by the Holy Father to uh, read the apostolic letter to preside at this beatification. Now, why that's interesting, and I think a good sign, is that really under the time of St. Paul VI, and certainly under St. John Paul II, the popes did beatifications themselves. So they did it whenever they traveled or in Rome, depending on what they chose. Uh, Pope Benedict decided to change that and go back to the earlier tradition, which is that beatifications took place in the local place by the local church, and canonizations uh, were reserved to the Holy Father himself, either in Rome or elsewhere if he chose. But when Benedict did that, there was a kind of a hybrid in that the cardinal delegate for those beatifications was always the prefect of the congregation, the Roman congregation, for the causes of saints. And so you had this somewhat odd reality that you had a cardinal from Rome who would travel to a place like, say, for example, Poland, uh, to preside over beatification, and then he would preach and preside in Italian uh, because he wouldn't speak Polish. Now, of course, English is a much more common language, but to have a local cardinal uh, designated means that that preaching and that, that local church really comes to the fore. Now, it was an unhappy circumstance that led to this. The prefect of the Congregation for Saints uh, resigned or was asked to resign from the congregation just about six weeks ago uh, due to some financial uh, allegations of financial uh, mismanagement. And so somebody had to be found to replace him. But I think in general, it's good to have a local bishop. Uh, it's a bit of a question because the, the closest cardinal is actually Cardinal O'Malley from Boston, who will be present, uh, but they chose Cardinal Tobin instead. So that's a, a bit of a new thing for this beatification and may continue in the future. Father Raymond D'Souza by Skype from Ontario. So Matthew, again, this mass of beatification for the Knights of Columbus, especially all over the world, is a grand celebration. It is. Uh, I think two million members, I think 17 countries, 
all of them riveted uh, by this day. Uh, and something that uh, we have been looking forward to for a long time. The cause itself opened in 1997. You have the, the local movement for the cause. Uh, we were talking last night during the, the, the vigil, uh, the, the work of uh, the local diocesan uh, committees, the, the, the theological commission, the, the historical commission, all of that had to be put together into a set of documents sent to Rome. You had the creation of the Positio. All of this takes time. So it's a beautiful journey, though, uh, because what this, a cause like this does, especially with someone of such notoriety, of such fame as Michael McGivney, it gives us a chance to spend those years, and I say years, getting to know him better. In that time, there was a remarkable uh, biography written about him by, I think, Douglas Brinkley. Uh, we have the, the, the drafting of the Positio. We have the appointment of a Roman postulator. We have the declaration of venerable by Pope uh, Benedict XVI in 2008. All of these things making McGivney better known. Uh, so his fame continues to increase, but at the same time we have that process uh, in Rome of verifying his life. And then, of course, we have the verification of the miracle. Well, our prayer vigil for priests and the Mass of Thanksgiving tomorrow came to us from St. Mary's where Father McGivney started the Knights of Columbus. But today's Mass of Beatification is being held at the Cathedral of St. Joseph in Hartford, Connecticut. And there, right now, is Archbishop William Laurie of Baltimore. He's the Supreme Chaplain for the Knights of Columbus. Uh, Your Excellency, this has to be a very special day for you and for the tens of thousands of Knights across the country. I wonder how the message of Father McGivney, the holiness that we are celebrating today, you as the spiritual guide for all these knights, how you think that this will impact their spiritual lives and yours and ours as well. Archbishop Lori, can you hear me? Can you hear us? I don't think so. All right, we'll be, we'll be back with Archbishop Laurie in just a little bit. But Father, uh, you can talk about the, uh, the spiritual uh, punch in the gut that, that these uh, Knights of Columbus are getting today when they, you know, this is a man that they've held in great honor for a long time, but to see the church recognize that is very significant. Yeah, I uh, may be an uplifting image more than a punch in the gut, but it's a great thing for the Knights. One of the things that uh, last night we focused on the parish priest that McGivney was, uh, but the knights are millions of them, and when we have a beatification, we often pay attention to the few hundred or few thousand, maybe under when Padre Pio was beatified, the hundreds of thousands who belong to his prayer groups, but this is a rare beatification when those people who are affiliated with Father McGivney is uh, two million people, and uh, they're going to be encouraged by, uh, by this. To be honest, uh, what Matthew was saying, Probably a knight who joined 30 years ago would not have learned much about Father McGivney, but the process of the cause has meant that there's a lot more attention given to him. And in almost every knight's council, I'm sure, across the world, the last month, this month meeting, they're going to be talking about Father McGivney. So they're going to have a lot of encouragement. There's that fraternal pride that one of our own has now been declared blessed. And then hopefully uh, that model of holiness of Father McGivney will inspire uh, some knights, hopefully many of them, to, if you want to say, intensify their own uh, spiritual life. So it's, uh, you know, beatification is not for the candidate. He's already in heaven and he's quite happy there. Uh, it's for those of us who are inspired by his model. And now we'll turn to him more intensely as an intercessor. So it's a very big day for the Knights of Columbus and it's a very exciting day for all of us who are knights, yes. Yeah, and the church in America, I know, Father, you're in Canada, but we'll, we'll, we'll include you in this. The church in America really celebrating. This is a parish priest from the 19th century right. in the United States who did study for a while in Canada. The miracle yeah. that was approved is, is a little boy in Tennessee. So, Matthew, for the church in America, this is a big day. It is. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's an historic day. But it's also an opportunity for us to look back on the life of Michael McGimmey. We've, been, we've talked about this last night during the vigil, how his life, his pastoral ministry, is a kind of microcosm of the ideal parish priest. But it's also a microcosm of so much of what happened in American Catholic history to the immigrants who came here, to the Irish Americans who faced social disabilities, who saw intolerance, uh, who saw outright bigotry. 
uh, the suffering that they had economically because of that. Uh, but then we can transpose that uh, to what we're facing today culturally. And I know a father I know wants to talk more about that, where we are in this cultural moment. All right, we'll talk more about that as we continue our coverage. Let's go to Archbishop William Laurie in Hartford, Connecticut. And Excellency, you are the spiritual leader of this great group of men. Talk about your own thoughts today and how you might um, envision so many of the Knights today celebrating this wonderful event in the history of the Knights of Columbus and in the church here in the United States. Uh, well, first of all, um, uh, it is a, what a day of joy, what a day of grace to uh, celebrate the beatification of, uh, of our great founder, uh, soon to be blessed Michael McGivney. Um, what Father McGivney did uh, was not only to organize the Knights of Columbus, but to give it its spiritual core. Uh, first of all, its mission of fraternal love and support uh, for the families and members of the Knights of Columbus that overflows uh, so broadly today. And number two, to help uh, men become better husbands and fathers and avidly practicing Catholics. That mission has not changed. And he infused the order with the principles of charity and unity and fraternity, uh, principles that really, in a way, sum up the gospel. And that spiritual core uh, remains today more vibrant than ever. And uh, I think that today, um, uh, so many men and their families find the Knights of Columbus uh, an immense support for living out the Christian life, for strengthening their family life, uh, and for being the Lord's disciples in the world today. Uh, the Knights of Columbus is, of course, a mainstay of the Church of the United States, but also in Canada, also in uh, Latin America, in Europe, the Philippines, and so many other parts of the world, including Korea. Archbishop Laurie, it's uh, Father D'Souza here in Canada. I wish I could be there with you, but I can't. Uh, one of the things that's been close to your heart in the Knights of Columbus in recent years is the question of religious liberty. And Father McGivney encountered a lot of discrimination, as did the Irish Catholics of that time. Do you think this new blessed will be a, a patron and an inter in, and a intercessor on those religious liberty issues today in the 21st century? Uh, I think that Father McGivney's uh intercession will be very powerful, very powerful uh, with regard to the pro-life movement, uh, the miracle uh, that we celebrate in this beatification was itself, one might say, a pro-life miracle. Father McGivney, as um, a 19th century parish priest, uh, knew well uh, the kind of uh, discrimination that was then a part of American society. Um, by his ability to build bridges, by his kindness and charity, uh, and his uh, quiet determination in the face of criticism, I think it gives us a wonderful example as to how we ought to uh, uh, respond to uh, religious liberty threats, whether they come uh, from some source in the government or whether they come from the culture at large. And I am quite confident that Father McGivney will intercede for us uh, as we seek uh, to respond to religious liberty challenges and to do so well and wisely. Your Excellency, this is uh, Matthew Bunsen. Uh, you are the Supreme Chaplain uh, for the Knights of Columbus. Uh, that makes you sort of a direct successor uh, to Father McGivney. Speaking as a priest, uh, what has been his influence on you over the years as you've experienced uh, and studied his life? And I'm sorry, Matthew, I, I can't quite hear you, unfortunately. If <laughs> Let me start over. I was saying that uh, as the Supreme Chaplain of the Knights, 
uh, you are sort of the direct successor uh, to Father McGivney. Uh, how has he influenced your priesthood, and how do you think that he will continue to influence uh, the, the lives of priests all over America, especially now as a beatus? Uh, when I became chaplain of the Knights of Columbus, of course I knew about Father McGivney, and uh, I understood that uh, his cause for sainthood had begun. But over these past 15 years, I have had so many wonderful opportunities to read about Father McGivney, to study his priesthood, uh, to pray to Father McGivney, to pray for his beatification and canonization uh, that I've developed, um, and it's a great blessing, a devotion to Father McGivney. And more than once I've said, Father McGivney is the parish priest uh, of my soul, of my heart. What Father McGivney has left us is a splendid, shining example of what it means to be a good, holy parish priest, engaged with parishioners, meeting the needs of parishioners uh, that, are, that have been discerned through prayer, bold and courageous action, but without putting oneself forward uh, as if one were the star. I think he is a, a model priest whose priesthood gave us uh, this wonderful organization we call the Knights of Columbus. Um, I think this is a moment uh, when we hold up his example as we are seeking um, to uh, renew the priesthood uh, in this still new millennium and to renew the priesthood in spite of all of the uh, challenges and setbacks that we have uh, experienced uh, in recent years. It's also a wonderful opportunity uh, for Knights of Columbus chaplains, my fellow chaplains, um, to be deepened uh, in the spirit of Father McGivney as we seek uh, to uh, lead the order spiritually. Uh, so this day of beatification uh, is a great and tremendous grace, certainly for me, for my fellow chaplains, but I would say for every busy, overworked uh, diocesan priest, whether in the United States or far, far beyond. What a blessing to have the Supreme Chaplain for the Knights of Columbus, Archbishop William Laurie of Baltimore, joining us on this very special day. Excellency, thank you for joining us from Hartford. It's a pleasure, thank you. So Father D'Souza, we've been talking this morning and, and certainly Archbishop Laurie pointed this out that this priest, this example of a, a priest who just put his everyday work into the realm of his spiritual life and really inspired his parishioners, what a great example. Wouldn't it be nice to see that this beatification of Michael McGivney would really fire up the priesthood to, to emulate and imitate his example as, uh, as pastors? Well, I think uh, that obviously that's true. I would mention, Brian, that we've seen a bit of the spirit of McGivney in this very unusual year, 2020. Uh, he died in 1890 uh, in a flu, plan, uh, flu pandemic, pardon me, at the Asiatic flu, as it was called then. And uh, we have been inspired this past year by stories of uh, parish priests across the United States, obviously, but all over the world with the coronavirus pandemic, really being heroic in catering for the spiritual and even physical health needs of their parishes. So even those who don't know who Father McGivney is, um, have had a bit of his spirit, uh, pandemic spirit, in this unusual uh, pandemic year. Uh, but looking forward, uh, Father McGivney is a priest who knew how to fire up the laity, especially lay men in a parish. And today, that is a task that is, I think, uh, commonly uh, acknowledged as being uh, essential. In Father McGivney's time, it probably was a bit innovative. Uh, but every parish priest knows that the success of his parish is only going to be um, realized if the lay faithful 
uh, take on their own proper role, and he remains the spiritual shepherd, but the flock has to be energized. And certainly uh, Father McGivney is a model for that, and the Knights of Columbus are an expression of that. And uh, I think many parish priests will be inspired if they take time to read his life to say, I can do things here in my own place because Father McGivney did them in his place in sometimes very difficult circumstances. It's always striking when you're studying the life of uh, Michael McGivney how much forethought he had, how he anticipated the development of uh, life for Catholics in the United States, but also for the church. What I mean by that is that uh, his encouragement uh, and his helping to guide lay people uh, to find their vocation in the world looked forward and anticipated the, the work of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, it looked forward and anticipated the work of John Paul II. I think of uh, the, the great uh, piece by John Paul II of Christi Fidelis Leici, in which we have to nurture and help lay people to find their vocation in the world, not just to participate as, as we're all called to in the life of the church, but then to go out into the world. And that was something I think that McGivney understood very powerfully in his time, that in the midst of all of this intolerance, hostility, and anti-Catholicism, going out into the culture to empower lay people, but also to form them properly in order to change culture. I think that was a, a brilliant stroke on his part. We are preparing to meet the Shackrith family of uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And I want to talk a little bit about the miracle before we talk to, to Daniel Shackle and his wife Michelle and, and little Mikey I know is there as well. This idea of a miracle that has to go through all these levels of approval, there's no doubt that this was a miracle. And, and uh, Archbishop Laurie referred to this earlier about how this is a pro-life miracle, that this child's life was saved before it was ever born. Well, we've had a spate of uh, pro-life miracles. Uh, it, we were in Rome covering mm -hmm. the, uh, the canonization of uh, now Saint Paul VI. Those miracles were in utero. In other words, they, they affected directly an unborn child. And that's exactly what happened here, where uh, young Michael McGivney uh, Shackle uh, was uh, suffering from high drops, fetal high drops, uh, which is the accumulation of fluid uh, that is generally considered absolutely fatal, uh, one of the most serious uh, conditions that you can have. Uh, and then, of course, the miracle took place, and I'll, I'll let the shackles uh, tell that story. We've, we've heard a beautiful testimony last night from Daniel about this. Uh, but that required extensive investigation by the, the Congregation of the Causes of Saints. So that's one of the key roles for the Roman postulator uh, to help guide that process. But it, it is a testament uh, to the fact that we are very thorough as a church. So, Father, one of the uh, stipulations of the approval of this miracle is that the people involved are praying exclusively to Father McGivney in this case. While all the other saints are there to help, there, there, there has to be some evidence that this miracle was at his intercession. That takes a great deal of faith. It does, because you might say, if you were in a very dire situation, why wouldn't you just ask the Blessed Mother or St. Peter or John the Baptist? Why would you go to a candidate who was not even beatified yet? So there's an act of faith there. Um, but, you know, in the communion of saints, the, the saints are not rivals. They work together, and they wish to have others lifted up. So I think in that communion of saints, there's an interesting dimension here in that the family, the parents went on a pilgrimage to Fatima, but asked their friends to pray through the intercession of Father McGivney. Now, once the miracle has been established medically, then there's a theological commission that looks at that question. Is it reasonable that this saint was asked for his intercession? So, All right, Father, we, we do have this family ready to go. So we want to get to Daniel Shackle, the father of Mikey, and his wife, Michelle. And Mikey himself is, is there with mom. It's just such a pleasure to see him. Daniel, I want to ask you about this issue of faith. When you and your family decided to put all of your eggs in one basket with Father Michael McGivney, which I know you had a very, a, a very clear uh, dedication to all along, that took an incredible amount of faith. Jesus constantly reminded those who were uh, recipients of his miracles, your faith has saved you. Do you feel that right now? You know, I feel like I just did what came natural at the moment that uh, we had, you know, had the long-standing devotion to Father McGivney. And I really, he's the one that brought me into the insurance business with the Knights of Columbus. I decided to become an agent because I read Parish Priest. And so he's always been a part of my vocation. 
and by extension a part of our family. We've always had that devotion, so it, it wasn't anything miraculous to us. It was just a normal thing to do. Uh, Daniel, uh, in your testimony last night uh, during the, the vigil, uh, you made several references to wanting people in this situation uh, not to look at it as hopeless. What would be your advice uh, to families who find themselves in similarly difficult situations such as the one that you found yourselves in uh, before Michael was born? Well, I think we always have to say, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. But I think we also have a, a loving God and a, a God that wants to sow mercy on us. And if we're accepting of his will and we're open to letting him work in our lives and using our faith and treating him like he's a beloved brother or father, then I think he treats us the same way. And there is no such thing as no hope. You know, as they say, God plus one's a majority. And there, there's no such thing as no hope in my mind. Uh, Daniel, did you find that the uh, the story of your uh, son and your family has inspired your brother Knights? And have you become a bit of a an apostle or an evangelist for Father McGivney's life and uh, intercession? I do know. I think it's definitely ramped it up. I think if you talk to the friends and brother Knights in my area, I think they would tell you that I've been that ever since I came to work for the Knights of Columbus. That's the way I've acted. So it really is just. I feel like this is a kind of an extension of what we've been living for years. Daniel Shackle and uh, Michelle and Mikey from Hartford, Connecticut. What a beautiful image of your family there. We celebrate with you. We thank God for the miracle that occurred for your family, for the Knights of Columbus, and that brought us to this great day. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's really hard to comprehend you know that the depth he's so cool about it now you know but i'm sure that at the time when you're you're looking at losing your child in a womb and they went to fatima mm -hmm. and he shared last night and, and in many of the the stories that he's told is how the gospel of the reading of mass that day was where jesus said to the official your son will live and they kept hearing that over and over in their heads as, they, as this miracle was happening. When there's hope and there's trust and there's faith, and uh, it, it occurs to me that uh, in the, the documentation for the, the validation for the miracle, it, they could probably have provided uh, screenshots of the texts asking people to ask for the intercession of Father Michael McGivney as evidence uh, that they were very focused on Michael McGivney. It's that trust again, uh, but also that hope uh, that you could see in the family in the face of what they were being told. And, and it wasn't an unrealistic hope or expectation, but it was trust and it was that faith that you've talked about. Well, Father D'Souza, it, it occurs to me that scripture can really speak to us. You know, as Catholics, we don't consider ourselves Bible readers often as some uh, Protestant denominations, but we know the Bible. I mean, we hear the Bible stories at every single mass. So. This, in this case, Scripture spoke directly to these people, and I wonder how you might uh, sort of encourage us to listen for God's answer in Holy Scripture. Well, I, that is true. I mean, the, the sacred word of God is very important to any Christian disciple. I think the reality of miracles that uh, canonization processes lift up to us is a reminder that the world of the Bible is not alien, that miracles do happen. Uh, we can read the Holy Scriptures and sometimes think, well, that's not our world. It's too different from what happens today. Uh, we have science and technology. We don't need the miracles that they needed. And these miracles point out that God continues to work, continues to work in an extraordinary way. And uh, to realize the Bible is the living Word of God for every generation. I would add, uh, Brian, that this miracle in the United States is kind of a spate of new American miracles. The miracle for St. John Henry Newman was an American miracle. The miracle for uh, St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross, Edith Stein was an American miracle. The miracle for Fulton Sheen, the miracle now for Michael McGivney. Um, and it was thought sometimes that American sort of uh, a scientific uh, faith in progress or technology made them less um, eager to pray for miracles. So this is a very promising sign over the last, say, 20 years that uh, in several important causes, the miracle took place in the United States and uh, Catholics in this part of the world can be proud of that. 
it makes us wonder how many miracles are actually occurring that we are not aware of. I mean, God, God's right. limitless in terms of miracles, but it's up to us to believe, to pray, to believe, and then see the miracle. Well, I think someone's trying to well, send a message to the United States, for one thing. Uh, as Father <laughs> has noted, uh, we are a very scientifically oriented country, and, and we should be, we're, but faith and reason. But the one other aspect, too, that um, as we saw when we were talking to Danny, and we, we've heard the family's testimony, is that in the communion of saints, that saints are our friends. And think of the friendship now that has developed between Michael McGivney and the Shackle family. Uh, all of their children, all 13, have been touched directly uh, by Michael McGivney. We have Carl Anderson in place at the uh, cathedral there in Hartford. Of course, he is the Supreme Knight of the Knights of Columbus. Mr. Anderson, thank you so much. I know this is a busy morning for you and we appreciate you being part of our coverage. Give us a sense of what you're feeling on this beatification morning. Well, a day of great joy, and especially for our, our two million members of the Knights of Columbus around the world, and we're so grateful to EWTN that's making it uh, possible for them to participate. So we have members in Philippines and Europe and Mexico and Canada, so thank you. Yeah, uh, Carl, uh, you have talked often about uh, the universal call to holiness. Uh, how does Michael McGivney fit into that, and what is the lesson he tells us today uh, as American Catholics, but as Catholics? Well, I think there's a number of lessons with Father McGivney. Uh, one is, you know, we think of the great saints and often we think about them over there somewhere. St. John Paul II, St. Mother Teresa. And uh, Father McGivney is a reminder, a uh, call to holiness right in your own neighborhood, right in your own parish, uh, parish priest. Uh, who would have thought a hundred years ago that this uh, Mike McGivney from Waterbury, Connecticut would someday change the church in the United States and throughout the world through his uh, life of holiness. So I think that's number one lesson. Uh, we're all called to uh, sanctity, to holiness, and uh, he's a great model for that. Mr. Anderson, Father Raymond D'Souza here in Canada, uh, where we have a lot of knights, hey, I'm Father. one of them. Um, what is the, uh, you know, Father McGivney, of course, a parish priest, but the vast majority of knights obviously are laymen, fathers of families, uh, working in the secular order. Uh, for this age of the lady in the church, uh, what is the, the value of men, Catholic men, uh, being active apostles and uh, the inspiration that Father McGivney gives to the order today? Thank you. Well, there's so many Historically, you know, the great orders in the church, Dominicans, Franciscans, Jesuits, Benedictines, uh, but how about the married layman who's got to be in the world, support his family, uh, working, citizenship? What is there for him in terms of a brotherhood? This is this, really the spiritual genius of Father McGivney to come along and say, look, here's a brotherhood for laymen, and it's a way of discipleship based on charity and unity and fraternity and so i think that's a great contribution to him and by him and you can see how it resonated with with really now millions of men throughout the world so i think that's uh, a great lesson father mcgivney and i think it's why he's being offered up by the church today for beatification as a model carl anderson supreme knight of the knights of columbus joining us from outside the cathedral of saint joseph in hartford connecticut where in just about 25 minutes or so, the beatification mass of Father Michael McGivney begins. Father, big things start out small. I'm sorry, not Father, Carl. <laughs> we don't want to, yeah, there's Father, there's Carl. Carl, big things start out small. Well, actually, Grandfather. Yeah, Grandfather, there. Well, we have that in common. But when, when Father McGivney, this young priest at St. Mary's there in Hartford, began this effort to, to fire up the men in his parish and be supportive of widows and orphans, he could not have imagined what you have seen over these past 20 years or so, even how the Knights have grown into this powerful worldwide group of men who have made such a difference. How do you think this saint, this blessed that we are declaring today is viewing this from where he sits? Well, I hope he's uh, filled with joy. I'm sure he is. 
You know, Father McGivney really, uh, one of the great things about him and about founding the Knights, he trusted laymen. Uh, he not only founded the Knights of Columbus, but then he stepped aside and said, look, I'm not going to be the leader, I'll be the chaplain. And so he predated the Second Vatican Council in this whole new initiative of laymen stepping up, uh, manning up, if you will, uh, to take on their proper role in the church, charity, uh, be active in the parish, uh, be this, the centerpiece with their wife in terms of their families, responsible for financial security, but also the spiritual life of their families, responsible citizenship, uh, stepping forward and renewing society in terms of the values of the gospel in areas like pro-life, uh, for example. So I think he's, he's uh, overjoyed uh, the fact, too, that the insurance program he started, you know, Knights of Columbus is one of the world's uh, largest insurance companies now, and it's maybe the largest company in the world dedicated publicly to Catholic principles. And you saw our miracle family, the Shackles, uh, Dan Shackle, one of our proud and successful insurance agents. So whether it's how to be in business, in the economy, in a Catholic position, how to serve your parish, how to be a good citizen, uh, all of these things, uh, the spiritual genius of Father McGivney. And if I would say just one further thing, you know, in the 19th century, tough going for Catholics, especially Catholic immigrants, which the Irish were, uh, and here was Father McGivney saying, look, we're not going to retreat. We're not going to uh, retreat into a ghetto. We're going to move forward. We're going to be active in society. We're going to make a change or make a difference in society. We're going to be faithful citizens and faithful Catholics. And that's something uh, we need as much today as we did back in Father McGivney's time. Yeah, Carl, to that point, uh, there was stern opposition to the building of uh, St. Mary's. Uh, there was intolerance. Uh, there was this idea that uh, the, the Irish Catholics simply were not wanted. Uh, we're living in a very similar situation today culturally. And how will yeah. blessed Michael McGivney uh, be a role model for us in, in addressing uh, that intolerance that uh, you've just talked about? Well, Father McGivney, you know, told the men around him, stand tall, be proud to be Catholic, and uh, don't retreat, and don't give up your Catholic identity. I think that's the big challenge to immigrants. They come to the United States, they want to fit in, they want to be integrated into the society, and can they do it without having to give up their Catholic identity? Father McGivney said, you sure can. Stay faithful and be good citizens. You can be both. And so I think that's uh, part of his legacy and a very important legacy for today. Um, we're not going to give up our legacy. We're not going to retreat on family values, on pro-life, on religious liberty. And at the same time, we're going to bring value to society in terms of charity and unity and brotherhood. And you look around today at what's happening, the violence, uh, prejudice, discrimination, poverty. Who's making a difference? Well more than a million Knights of Columbus and a quarter of a million uh, in Canada, a million in the United States, bringing brotherhood, unity, charity into our neighborhoods. That's what the church has always done. Mr. Anderson, you mentioned that principle of unity of the Knights of Columbus. In this age, not just in the United States or Canada, but all over the world, there's this sense of division, of rancor, of discord. What is the value of this saint at this time, this Beatus at this time, for unity and fraternity, uh, not so much the charity, but the unity and fraternity? Well, I think, again, uh, if we look at the life of Father McGivney, it's a life centered on the sacramental life of the church. That's why it's so important he's a parish priest. Eucharistic foundation of what makes us Catholic, uh, Mary as a model. Uh, it's not coincidental Knights of Columbus founded at St. Mary's Church in New Haven. So we're not just, you know, a christened NGO, volunteer service organization that happens to have chaplains. No, our concept of charity, unity, brotherhood has a roots in our Catholic faith and primarily in our Eucharistic faith. And so uh, that's the strength and that's what makes us so different. So uh, for us, charity isn't just 
uh, largesse, we have a few extra coins in our pockets, so we put them uh, in the collection plate. No, it's like uh, when brothers help each other or a father helps a son. Uh, we don't call that charity. We call it something else because we're members of the same family. And that's what our unity is about as Knights of Columbus. And that's what our fraternity and brotherhood is about because uh, we have the same father and we have the same creator and we have the same redeemer. And that makes all the difference. And that's been the history of the church for 2,000 years. And Father McGivney is helping us live that in a more contemporary way today. Supreme Knight Carl Anderson, we can't thank you enough for the leadership that you have shown at the head of the Knights of Columbus and the Knights' support of EWTN. We celebrate with you today the beatification of your founder, Father Michael McGivney. We'll let you get into the Mass. Thank you. Thank you very much. God bless. And much has been said about the sacramental life of the church. And I don't know about you guys, but uh, Father, you could continue during the pandemic, but for many of us, we were really separated from the sacraments during this uh, the pandemic lockdown. Let's talk a little well, bit about, this is the basis of Catholicism, our sacraments. It, uh, yes, it is uh, the basis. I'll tell you something, it is true that us priests uh, could continue celebrating mass, but it was a very strange and uh, in a bad way, disturbing experience, a Sunday mass with uh, no one in the church or uh, two or three people in the church, Holy Week, uh, with, you know, four people uh, in a big church. I mean, so we did have the sacraments, and I'm very grateful, obviously, as a priest, that I never had to be without the Eucharist, as so many of my parishioners did. But um, but around the altar, we're meant to be together. And even if the Mass is valid and it continues, independent of the lay faithful, as it did during those early months of the pandemic, that's not, our, that's not an ideal. And that was a suffering in the church and that unity between the priest and his parish, uh, between the priest and the lay faithful expressed in the, uh, in the Mass itself, we learned how important that was when we just had the Mass without the faithful. And I, I dare say you wouldn't find a single priest, let alone a parish priest, who would say that uh, that was anything but, but terribly painful for all uh, concerned. Uh, our unity comes from the Eucharist, and although we can have the Eucharist without all of us gathered, uh, that unity needs to be expressed. And, uh, and thanks be to God, we're back together, at least in a limited way. And we can ask this saint who died in a pandemic, Beatus Blessed who died in a pandemic, uh, to keep those further lockdowns away by his uh, intercession if we could. Yeah, it's appropriate that we can celebrate that and, and seek his intercession at this time of continued pandemic. Well, and faith has been tested for so many Catholics uh, during this time. Uh, and the joy that we all felt of being able to go back to Mass, so I think McGivney serving for 13 years as a parish priest, saying Mass every day, uh, hearing confessions every day. Uh, he's been called the saint of the ordinary. Uh, and I think Catholics throughout this year have longed for the ordinary. Not just ordinary time, right. but the ordinary. <laughs> return to what we've always known. And one thing that um, when we think about the founding of uh, the Knights of Columbus in 1882, that same year, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, the German philosopher, coined one of the phrases that became a hallmark and is still used today, that God is dead. It's fascinating to me that while Nietzsche is writing this, that God is dead, Michael McGivney is founding the Knights of Columbus that same year that has gone on to demonstrate every day in the ordinary life of everyone that God is truly alive and that he is love. How beautiful it was to yeah. see the Shackley family. Um, I mean, there was pure evidence, Father, that God is very much alive and still working miracles in our lives. Well, the presence of, uh, of families like the Miracle family, but all the other families of the Knights of Columbus, very few of them, obviously, or any, have a story as remarkable as uh, Michael's family, uh, the little Michael's family. Uh, but that ordinary life of joy, of happiness uh, in the family, Catholic family life, is very much uh, what the Knights of Columbus uh, promote. I would say that um, one of the things our viewers will see in a moment is we're going to see something that reminds us the pandemic is not over. We're going to see a pandemic beatification mass. Um, very few people, if this had been a normal time, it probably would have been in a stadium or a field with you know, 30, 40, 50, 100,000 people 
uh, gathered. And this also uh, indicates something unusual about Father McGivney's beatification. Most of the other beatifications scheduled have been postponed in 2020. There have been a few, um, but this one is going ahead. But uh, when you see that uh, church, uh, the Cathedral Church of Hartford, uh, at only 20% or 25% of capacity, instead of being jam-packed for beatification. We're about 15 minutes away. Somehow we lost Father's Skype connection. He was joining us by Skype from Ontario. But we're about 15 minutes away from the beginning of this beatification mass, which is officially called the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and Rite of Beatification of the Venerable Servant of God, Michael McGivney. I like to put the J in there because it stands <laughs> for Joseph. You know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of St. Joseph, and I would imagine that St. Joseph had quite an impact on this young priest. Oh, I, I think he certainly did. Um, St. Joseph, uh, the, the custos, uh, the, the, the custodian uh, that, that you always talk about, mm -hmm. Brian, uh, he was a great father. And uh, Michael McGivney, Father McGivney, was a father, a true father uh, to his flock. And I I'm, I'm, have no doubt that Joseph played an important role in that. And here we are also at the Cathedral of St. Joseph. So remind us again, what will happen now in the next couple of hours there at the Cathedral of St. Joseph in Hartford, Connecticut? Well, as Father noted, it's going to look a little different, although we're all getting used to having these uh, masses with masks and everything else, so a lot of social distancing. Uh, we will have the start of the mass, the procession as always, we'll have the introductory rites, and then we go right into the rite of beatification. As I was saying earlier, you have the request the formal request, a petition is made. When, at canonizations, uh, it's, the re request is made for, to the, directly to the Holy Father. In this case, it will be directed to the representative of the Holy Father, that's uh, Joseph Cardinal Tobin uh, from Newark, who is the, the Pope's official representative. Then we have the reading of the apostolic letter from uh, Pope Francis. It will be read first in Latin and then in English, uh, Latin by Cardinal Tobin, and then English, I believe, by Archbishop Blair. Uh, in that letter, it uh, is very straightforward. It simply stipulates uh, that uh, at, in honor of the request that has been made and after all appropriate uh, investigations, uh, he is declared blessed and this is the day uh, that we will honor him. That's uh, the, the 13th of August. Then uh, we have the unveiling of the image, which is one of the, the highlights always. Uh, and then we have the presentation of the relic. Uh, then we move right back into the Mass. So it's, it's a fairly short uh, rite, uh, but it's filled with import uh, and deep significance. I'm curious, Father D'Souza, who is back with us now, by the way, I'm curious, you mentioned that, that this is one of the few beatifications that has gone forward during the pandemic. And I think of the Holy Father approving this and, and, and fairly quickly arranging this to happen today. And then also when he came to the United States and I think was... 2015 and, and canonized Junipero Serra without all the required miracles. I wonder if he's trying to send a message to the United States here. Well, in, in fairness, uh, the accelerated uh, canonization of Junipero Serra was accompanied by two saints for Canada, also an accelerated plus one in Brazil and one in Sri Lanka. So the Holy Father, Pope Francis, wants these missionary saints, and that was the category Serra was uh, canonized under. Uh, but in general, uh, Pope Francis is very much in the line of John Paul II and Benedict. He wants more saints, uh, different parts of the world, closer to us in time, and uh, to encourage us in the ways of holiness. So really this is, he's continuing Pope Francis's uh, three pontificate emphasis on these new saints. And we're going to see, as uh, Matthew mentioned, a new development. I mean, it's not a formal development, but sort of a new custom that we see now that the relics of the saint are now carried up by the people healed by the saints. So the Shackley family will do that. It happened also at Cardinal Newman's canonization at St. John Paul's beatification, this, uh, this highlighting of those who were uh, healed in these uh, uh, miracles. So that's a new dimension that sort of makes, if you want to say, the new uh, blesseds and saints seem close to us. So I think Pope Francis is very pleased that this one has gone ahead, even the other ones uh, have been uh, delayed uh, in different parts of the world depending on their pandemic uh, circumstances. But we're grateful that it's gonna take place today. You mentioned the Miracle family, the Shackley family. We got a glimpse of them earlier and chatted very briefly with Daniel the father. But I encourage you to just Google McGivney Miracle 
and you will see this beautiful video that the Knights of Columbus have put together. I watched it the other day and I was just in awe of this. This is, this is Mikey. This is the, the young man who was in his mother's womb and he had a, a condition where his organs were filling with fluid and the doctor said zero chance of survival. Right. And the miracle I, occurred in utero, Father. I've sent that uh, that link to people, encourage them to watch that or the documentary on Father McGivney. And I send along a warning. I said, get your get your handkerchief or get your tissues. You're going to cry when you watch that miracle story. It's it's very very moving, and uh, it's 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 a beautiful uh, testament to God's grace in the world uh, world today. So. Do watch it, but uh, get ready to cry. You're going to cry. One of the things the Knights of Columbus has done very effectively is the use of media. Their their productions are really super. And these short snippets that people will watch on YouTube, I would imagine many Americans are learning much more about this soon to be beatus. Well, it goes back to the value of this of an actual cause. Uh, mm -hmm. People think it's just a sort of a deliberative uh, judicial process. No, there, there are very good reasons and sound reasons why we do these things. And, and to go back to, to the question of beatifications and canonizations around the world, John Paul II, of course, uh, shattered every record uh, for canonizations in his magnificent pontificate. But he would also make two important points. The first is that uh, sanctity is truly universal. Uh, we were talking with Carl Anderson about that, the universal call to holiness that is something that uh, Father McGivney understood very powerfully but they are also contemporary. Uh, Father McGivney is not that far removed from us today. We've had uh, beatifications for Saints uh, Carlo Acutis just recently. Uh, who, 15 years 15 old. 15 years died. old who died I think in, in 2006. These are extraordinary men and women, but they're also contemporary men and women. So there's a message for us today. And that, uh, it, it, there's a twofold thing in that, in that saints come in every age. Uh, for us as role models, but that also means that they're saints for every age. And saints who lived in the first century, who died in the arenas, who were tortured and died at the hands of the Romans are as meaningful to us today as Carlo Acutis. And Carlo Acutis one day will be as meaningful a thousand years from now uh, when people look back on his holiness that was needed at a time when social communications, when social media is so fraught and so perilous for us, he shows us the way how to deal with social media in a way that really brings people to Christ. And Father, many of your parishioners are, are young college-age students and this young Saint Carlo Acutis and relatively young Father Michael J. McGivney. Uh, this has to be an inspiration to young people that sanctity is something to strive for. Well, there's lots of Knights of Columbus councils, of course, that are for uh, university-age men, college-age men, and uh, we have Pierre Giorgio Frassati, St. Therese of Lisieux, some of the more popular saints who are very, uh, very young. Saints are for every age, and we're learning about Father McGivney. I think probably it's fair to say people didn't know much about him. This will change that. And I'd add another thing to what Matthew added, is that actually this cause teaches us about our own history when we learn about a saint. And I think many American Catholics who look around at a church that is largely immigrant again, uh, and the challenges that brings, uh, may have forgotten that that's really the Catholic story in the United States. And in the 19th century, it wasn't uh, Latino immigrants, it was Irish immigrants, and they faced a lot of uh, persecution, and uh, they were looked down upon because they were immigrants in a new country. And uh, so we learned about Father McGivney, uh, but we learn about the history of that time, and I think that his beatification can be a history lesson for especially American Catholics about how life was not that long ago and how the lessons learned then are applicable today uh, for those new immigrants who come to this country. Carl Anderson mentioned that, uh, who want to be Americans uh, but can't or ought not to forget about being Catholics. What an important point you make about learning our own history at a time when there is a movement to erase so much of our history. This is truly a reminder of how valuable our history can be. Well, Michael McGivney understood that. He came from a family that had arrived in the United States, a, a, a family that faced persecution, uh, but that was also keenly aware of its own Catholic faith and strove very hard to keep it. And McGivney understood that one of the things that uh, his men in the parish and in that time they were being lured away from the faith into secret societies. 
uh, that had the promise of enculturation, that uh, you'll be accepted, you'll have social advancement, and all you have to do is wipe away who you are, wipe away your faith, wipe away your traditions, come and join us. Knowing and honoring and treasuring our faith uh, is essential, but also knowing how we got here is also essential, and McGivney is a, a great reminder of that. And look what has happened over the years. We're about five minutes away from the beginning of this beautiful beatification mass from the Cathedral of St. Joseph in Hartford. Uh, Joseph Cardinal Tobin will be celebrating. He'll be also uh, presenting the homily at this mass. Before we take you to Hartford for that uh, wonderful event here on EWTN, I'd like to get some final thoughts from our team members. Uh, Father Raymond D'Souza with us by Skype from Ontario, Canada. Father, as we approach this mass of beatification. Your thoughts this morning? Well, first of all, just a day of joy for all Knights of Columbus, all my brother Knights. It's a day to rejoice, but it's also a day to take encouragement uh, for times that are not easy. Um, there are many Catholics today, especially young Catholics, looking to what kind of careers they're going to have. And in many fields now, to be uh, uh, known as a Catholic, to take your faith seriously, to be open about that, uh, means sacrificing professional advancement, sometimes even uh, the door closed in your face. That happened in the time of Father McGivney. And we need to learn not to retreat, but also to be expect, or rather to expect that we're going to pay a price for our faith. And Father McGivney strengthened the men of his time to be able to pay that price. So I think it's, it comes at a very opportune time, this beatification. Uh, being a Catholic in public life, in just ordinary corporate life, in education, in law, in business, in so many fields today, um, it's becoming more challenging. And Father McGivney knew those challenges well. And as a good pastor, he strengthened his flock uh, for, the, uh, for the storms ahead, for the wolves uh, that prowl around. And so a day of rejoicing certainly for us as knights, uh, but a day also for encouragement uh, and strength uh, in facing the challenges that are, not, that are not just ahead, but already present. Father Raymond D'Souza, Father, will be joining us again after the Beatification Mass. And your thoughts, Matthew? Well, we have talked a lot about uh, the legacy of Michael McGivney. Uh, there's a date that uh, popped into my mind, uh, and that's 1891, and that is the promulgation of uh, Rerum Novarum, the magnificent encyclical that became the Magna Carta for Catholic social teaching by Leo XIII. Father McGivney died a year before that. He founded the Knights of Columbus about nine years before that. Father McGivney, and especially the Knights of Columbus with practical charity, embody so much of Catholic social teaching. But two of the things, uh, the two of the pillars of Catholic social teaching that I think are so central to this is the role of the pursuit of the common good, of how we can build a, a proper society with the Catholic faith as our guiding principle but then also human dignity. Father McGivney was concerned about the loss of the dignity of his flock from intolerance, but also from economic conditions. He was very focused on helping his flock to have that dignity. And the Knights of Columbus now, in all of its magnificent uh, efforts and charity around the world, strive with the pro-life cause, with the disaster relief, with religious liberty, Human dignity, the dignity of the human person is at the core of Catholic social teaching. And Father McGivney was the great herald for that uh, in his time, anticipating just by that year after his death, rerum novarum and the great teachings of the Pope since. Well, let's keep in mind all of our parish priests. Let's uh, pray to blessed Father McGivney after today uh, for those who are in a parish that they can see the value of what they are doing. We talked about the, the Dominicans who are now, uh, they have been for years at St. Mary's where Father McGivney is. So many of those men are brilliant. They could have done anything with their lives and they chose to say yes to Jesus. So let's keep them all in mind today as we watch this beautiful celebration. This is a great tradition in our church to see someone be recognized for their holiness. It is, as, as Father says, it's a day of celebration, uh, but it's also a day of reflection. Uh, and it's a day of taking stock uh, for ourselves of how we can follow his lead. We're not, all of us aren't called to the priesthood, but we are certainly called to be saints. All right, and Matthew this, Bunsen, uh, Father, quickly. Yeah, and this is the church doing what the church exists for. What does the church exist for? <laughs> to get people to heaven. That's really the mission 
of the church. And uh, when we have a beatification, it's a way of saying that the church is doing what the Lord Jesus asked her to do, which is to get people to heaven. Father Raymond D'Souza, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, I'm Brian Patrick, and we now take you to the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and the rite of beatification for Father Michael McGivney at the Cathedral of St. Joseph in Hartford, Connecticut.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you. Your Eminence Cardinal Tobin, it is with great joy that I welcome you as the appointed representative of Pope Francis for this liturgy of the edification. I also extend a warm welcome to our Apostolic Nuncio, Archbishop Pierre, and to the cardinals and other representative bishops, clergy, and faithful who are here today to share in the joyful celebration of the beatification of the Venerable Father Michael McGivney, a priest of this archdiocese and the founder of the Knights of Columbus. I say representative inasmuch as the pandemic in which we find ourselves has greatly limited, limited the invitations to today's liturgy, and I'm all the more grateful to those who have traveled a distance to be here under present circumstances. I also welcome those many people who are able to be with us in spirit and prayer thanks to the streaming of this liturgy over the internet, on television, and on radio. Thank you all for your participation. My dear brothers and sisters, let us call to mind our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I've done, in what I've failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, bless Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Please be seated. Your Eminence, in 1997, 
my predecessor, the Most Reverend Daniel A. Cronin, who honors us with his presence today, established the Hartford Archdiocesan Tribunal, which initiated the process for the cause of beatification and canonization of the servant of God, Father Michael Joseph McGivney. Through the work of the tribunal and the efforts of two postulators in succession, and with the unfailing support of the Knights of Columbus, we have received a favorable opinion from the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. Pope Francis confirmed the extraordinary favor attributed to the intercession of Father McGivney, and I now ask your eminence to read the decree of the Holy Father by which the servant of God, Michael McGivney, will be enrolled in the official catalog of the blessings of our church. Father Michael J. McGivney is recognized as a model parish priest who has inspired generations of priests and presented to the church a paradigm for engagement with the laity. In his crowning achievement of founding the Knights of Columbus, he anticipated the call of the Second Vatican Council for greater lay participation in the mission of the church. By doing so, Father McGivney offered a deeply enculturated model of fraternal community for laymen, a model that was directed toward, not away from, parish life. And in this way, he has had an enduring effect upon the Church in America and beyond. He embodied the Order's principles of charity, unity, and fraternity, and his example continues to guide the two million members of the Knights of Columbus today. Recalling the deep impression he made on people, a priest who knew him wrote that parishioners, quote, called him a positive saint and meant it. However, Father McGivney's holiness did not separate him from others. Rather, it drew him into their lives as he shared in the joys and hardships which he himself had experienced. Born August 12, 1852 in Waterbury, Connecticut, Michael Joseph McGivney was the eldest of 13 children of Irish immigrant parents. He grew up amid 19th century anti-Catholic sentiment while completing his primary education and then joining his father in local factory work. He began preparation for the priesthood at age 16, excelling in his studies at St. Hyathen College in Quebec. Our Lady of Angels Seminary in Niagara Falls, New York, and St. Mary's Seminary in Montreal, before returning home upon the death of his father. With the loss of the family's breadwinner, Michael was unable to continue his studies until Hartford's Bishop Francis McFarland provided a scholarship to St. Mary's Seminary in Baltimore. After four years of theological studies, he was ordained to the priesthood in the nation's first cathedral on December 22, 1877, and was assigned to St. Mary's Church in New Haven, Connecticut. In response to the needs of his people, Father McGivney established the Knights of Columbus in 1882 with a group of laymen to sustain the faith of Catholics and provide financial protection for their families especially following the death of the breadwinner. Explaining the mission of the new Fraternal Benefits Society, he wrote, quote, Unity and charity is our motto. Unity in order to gain strength, to be charitable to each other, in benevolence 
whilst we live and in bestowing financial aid to those whom we have to mourn our loss. His vision of fraternal charity, lived out today by Knights and their families, is more relevant than ever, as indicated by the recent encyclical of Pope Francis Fratelli Tutti, which is dedicated to the importance of fraternity and social friendship. Pope Francis paid tribute to Father McGivney earlier this year, saying that the Knights of Columbus have remained faithful, quote, to the vision of your founder, Venerable Michael McGivney, who was inspired by the principles of Christian charity and fraternity to assist those most in need. Previous popes have made similar statements. Recognizing Father McGivney's continued influence on the order, Pope St. John Paul II wrote in 2003, quote, in fidelity to the vision of Father McGivney, may you continue to seek new ways of being a leaven of the gospel in the world and a spiritual force for the renewal of the church in holiness, unity, and truth. Pope Benedict XVI, during his apostolic visit to the United States in 2008, further noted, quote, the remarkable accomplishment of that exemplary American priest, the Venerable Michael McGivney, whose vision and zeal led to the establishment of the Knights of Columbus. After seven years as assistant pastor of St. Mary's Church, Father McGivney became pastor of St. Thomas Church in Thomaston, Connecticut, and a neighboring mission church, Immaculate Conception, in Terryville. He spent his entire priesthood in, in parish ministry while continuing to serve as Supreme Chaplain for the Knights of Columbus. He died amid a viral pandemic on August 14, 1890, two days after his 38th birthday. His funeral procession in his hometown of Waterbury was the largest the city had ever seen, with the bishop, fellow priests, and members of the Knights of Columbus coming from all parts of the state. To this day, Father McGivney's holiness of life and exemplary service continue to inspire priests throughout America and around the world, and his vision for an active and engaged laity serves as a witness to the power of spiritual brotherhood and charity. On behalf of His Holiness Pope Francis, I will read the apostolic letter with which the Holy Father proclaims the venerable servant of God, Michael McGivney, to be known as blessed. Please stand. Nos, vota fratris nostri Leonardi Pauli Blair. Nec non plurimorum alilorum fratrum venetiscupatus, volturorum Christi Fidelium explentes. De congregationis de causes sanctorum consulto. Autoritate nostra apostolica, facultatum facimus ut venerabilis servus Dei, Michael McGivney, presbiter diocesanus, fundator equitum Colombi, Perdens in Evangelo annunciando che mire subveniava ad indigenzium necessitat necessitativus, Christianum promovens solidalem caritatem ac mutum auxilium. Beati nomi in posterium appelletur, atque dice, die dit decima terza mensi augusti, quotanis in locis et modis iure status statutis celebrari posit. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Datum Rome Laterani, dia trecesimo mensis septembris, 
Anno Domini bismillenismo decesimo pontificatus nostri octavo Francescus. It is now my privilege to read an English translation of the apostolic letter. Acceding to the desire of our brother, the most reverend Leonard Paul Blair, Archbishop of Hartford, and many of our other brothers in the Episcopate and members of Christ's faithful, having consulted the congregation for the causes of the saints, we, by our apostolic authority, decree that the venerable servant of God, Michael McGivney, diocesan priest, founder of the Knights of Columbus, whose zeal for the proclamation of the gospel and generous concern for the needs of his brothers and sisters made him an outstanding witness of Christian solidarity and fraternal assistance, henceforth be given the title of blessed, and that his liturgical memorial be kept each year on the 13th day of August in those places laid down by the norm of law. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen, given in Rome at St. John Lateran on the 13th day of September in the year 2020, the eighth of our pontificate, Francis.
please be seated. Your Eminence, on behalf of all the clergy, religious, and laity of the Archdiocese of Hartford, I thank you for having presided at this liturgy, and I ask that you please convey to Pope Francis our heartfelt gratitude for the beatification that has taken place today. I believe that Father McGivney is truly Pope Francis's kind of priest, a model in his time of closeness to Christ's sheep on the peripheries of life and society. Please stand.
let us pray. God of eternal mercy, who set your priest, blessed Michael, in the church to comfort the suffering and the weary, the lonely and the oppressed, with works of charity and a gentle heart. Grant that through his intercession we too may become vessels of mercy in our day, and so enter into our eternal inheritance. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, this is the fasting that I wish, releasing those bound unjustly, untying the thongs of the yoke, setting free the oppressed, breaking every yoke, sharing your bread with the hungry, sheltering the oppressed and the homeless, clothing the naked when you see them, and not turning your back on your own. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your wound shall be quickly healed. Your vindication shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove from your midst oppression, false accusation, and malicious speech, if you bestow your bread on the hungry and satisfy the afflicted, then light shall rise for you in darkness, and the gloom shall become for you like midday. Then the Lord will guide you always and give you plenty even on the parched land. He will renew your strength and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring whose water never fails. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, I, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to live in a manner worthy of the call you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another through love, striving to preserve the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. One body and one spirit, as you were also called to the one hope of your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And he gave some as apostles, others as prophets, others as evangelists, others as pastors and teachers, to equip the holy ones for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of faith and knowledge of the Son of God, to mature to manhood, to the extent of the full stature of Christ. The word of the Lord. Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. He began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in the New Testament, in the letter to the Hebrews, a message is addressed to a community that is in crisis. The inspired author of that message called the letter a message of encouragement directed to Christians in danger of losing hope. This danger was not due to any persecution from outsiders but to a weariness with the demands of Christian life and a growing indifference to their own calling. The letter calls the, to the, the attention of the suffering community to many reasons for them to continue walking confidently together in their, heaven, their pilgrimage towards their heavenly homeland. Among those reasons, the author reminds them that, in fact, they're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses who will give them courage to go on. What is more, the author writes, if Christians persevere in fidelity to the word in which they've believed, they're assured of possessing forever the kingdom of God. In his beautiful reflection on holiness, Pope Francis dares to name some of those witnesses. Abraham, Sarah, Moses, Gideon, and others. Today, in the name of the Church, Pope Francis recognizes one more face among those witnesses. The serene, youthful, countenance of Father Michael Joseph McGivney. Brothers and sisters, what we celebrate today is first and foremost the faithfulness of God, the faithfulness of God to the body of his son, the church. In recognizing the holiness of Father McGivney, there are timely signs of God's providential care that can speak in a personal way to each one of us, especially at this moment of our history. 
Michael McGivney, we see the face of a son of immigrants who gave his life in pastoral service of those most recently arrived in this country. We meet the eldest of 13 children who work to keep families united in dignity and security. We are in the presence of an apostle who cared for victims of an epidemic before he himself would die of the disease. We acknowledge gratefully the providence of God in confirming the holiness of this witness by the miraculous cure of an unborn child, healed in utero of a fatal multi-organ failure after prayer by his family to Father McGivney. We praise God for the timeliness of this celebration because 130 years after his death, the brief life of this holy man speaks eloquently to our own path to holiness. We should listen to his testimony. Since Jesus asks each one of us to become a saint, to be perfect just as your heavenly Father is perfect, to be merciful, just as your Heavenly Father is merciful. The Second Vatican Council reminded the Church that all the faithful, whatever their condition or state, are called by the Lord, each in his or her own way, to that perfect holiness by which the Father is perfect. Each and in his or her own way. Two centuries before the Council, St. Alphonsus Liguori wrote that God wishes all to be saints, and each one according to his or her state of life, the religious as religious, the mother as mother, the priest as a priest, the married as married, the man of business as a man of business, the soldier as a soldier, and so on, to every state of life. Each one of us can certainly find encouragement in the life of Father McGivney, but none more than those of us who are called to become saints as parish priests. A parish, of course, is more than the priest. A parish is meant to be the church of the living, the church living in the midst of the homes of her sons and daughters. Pope Francis teaches that the parish retains its relevance as an instrument of the gospel if it is really in contact with the homes and lives of its people and is willing to go out of itself in missionary work. Father McGivney's life is an illustration of how a holy priest can provide the necessary and intimate connection so crucial in the life and mission of a parish. Father McGivney's formation and pastoral practice began with his family, which nurtured his growth in grace and provided an ambiance in which he and two of his brothers could hear the call to serve the Lord as priests. Although he excelled in his studies, before he ever opened a book of theology, he worked in a factory where he learned firsthand the struggles of his fellow workers. The experience would never permit him to remain aloof from the challenges faced by laborers. Father Michael knew the simple, indispensable requirement for a pastor to love his people. One of his biographers describes that affection. He loved his parishioners. The only thing that he liked better than working with them on grand plans and projects was standing back and watching them work together under the, the light of Christ. Father McGivney had no need to advance himself and was content and effective leading his people from behind the scene. He enjoyed their company, 
and organized activities that created community. He was with them in their sorrows, in the times of death and bereavement. He was sanctifying by doing what good priests, good parish priests do today, day in and day out. His parish was never limited by the registration rolls. He was not a stranger to jails or hospitals. He fostered respectful relationships with other Christian churches and civil authorities. He was a bridge builder who shunned walls. Even the signature accomplishment for which he is most remembered, the founding of the Knights of Columbus, grew out of his ministry as a parish priest. This great brotherhood of two million men now spanning the globe was born from the pastoral ingenuity of a parish priest to respond to the twin challenges faced by the people he served. Because he knew his people well, so well, he recognized the need to help men care for their families, provide for their families in the event of their death, and to remain always united with the church. Far from the traditional parish society under, that existed under a real or imagined clerical thumb, the Knights nevertheless had an essential connection with the body of Christ. Father McGivney had no need to control the Knights of Columbus. He offered a vision, born from practical charity, and then trusted the Knights. Like every good parish priest, Father McGivney paid a price for his zeal. His closeness to the people did not insulate him from sharing intimately and intensely their suffering. Like Jesus, he wept with them. His grief at the looming execution of his friend, Chip Smith, led the condemned man to console him. Long before his exhausted body surrendered to disease, he died daily to his own desires and thus manifested the greatest love of all, the love of his master, to lay down his life for his friends. Brothers and sisters, how good God is to give the church, blessed Michael Joseph McGivney, at this moment of our common pilgrimage. In a time of suffering and division, we glimpse his face among the cloud of witnesses that surround us and urge us on. In blessed Michael, we are reminded that life is not transactional, but a gift to be shared. We appreciate that true worship, right fasting, is always centered on a right relationship with God and others, particularly those on the margin of society. And that Christian unity is more than a simple adherence to a common belief. We accept that like him, God calls each one of us in our own day and our own way to be vessels of mercy and so enter into our heavenly inheritance. Amen.
Brothers and sisters, as we now offer our prayer for the, our community and for the world, let us pray in the spirit of blessed Michael, not only for ourselves and our own needs, but for the entire people. pour son délégué apostolique, le cardinal Tobin, pour Monseigneur Blair et pour tous les évêques. Que Dieu les guide et les protège alors qu'ils enseignent, dirigent et sanctifient le troupeau qui leur est confié. We pray to the Lord. Особливо за тих, які служать тут, в архідієцезії Гартфорд, та за тих, які співпрацюють з лицарями Колумба. Нехай життя отця Макгівні, святого та героїчного парафіального священника, надихне їх переживати своє покликання у вірності та з євангельською ревністю. We pray to the Lord. For the lady that they will courageously take up their baptismal call to become missionary disciples and contribute to the sanctification of the world, as Father McGivney called the men of his parish to do through the Knights of Columbus. We pray to the Lord. For vocations that Father McGivney will continue to inspire many young people as he did his two brothers and other relatives who have answered God's call. Call of the priesthood and religious life. We pray to the Lord. por los inmigrantes y por las familias, especialmente aquellas que sufren por la muerte del sostén de la familia. Que el Padre Magibni interceda por ellos desde el cielo como lo hizo en la tierra. We pray to the Lord. Para sa pagtaguyod ng buhay at para sa mga magulang na may kinakaharap na problema sa pagbubuntis, na sana ipanalangin sila ni Father McGivney at tulungan sana ang lahat ng tao na masilayan ang anyo ng Diyos sa bawat buhay ng tao, lalong-lalo na sa mga mahihirap at mahihina. We pray to the Lord. Módlmy się o rozwój rycerzy Kolumba w Stanach Zjednoczonych w Kanadzie, Meksyku, na Filipinach, w Polsce, na Ukrainie, Litwie, w Korei Południowej, Francji i w innych krajach. Aby wizja księdza McGivneya nadal inspirowała mężczyzn na całym świecie do wyrażania wiary przez uczynki. We pray to the Lord. for the United States of America, especially during this general election, that the principles of charity, unity, and fraternity so dear to the heart of Father McGivney might renew and transform our one nation under God. We pray to the Lord. For our beloved dead, especially those who have perished from the coronavirus, that Father McGivney, who ministered without hesitation during the pandemic of his own day, may intercede for us today and hasten the end of the coronavirus pandemic. We pray to the Lord. God of mercy, you know the many needs of your people. Hear our prayers, and through the intercession of blessed Michael, grant what we ask in faith, through Christ our Lord.
Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. We humbly implore your majesty, almighty God, that just as the offerings made in honor of blessed Michael bear witness to the glory of divine power, so they may impart to us the effects of your salvation through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For as on the festival of blessed Michael, you bid your church rejoice, so too you strengthen her by the example of his holy life. Teach her by the words of pre preaching, and keep her safe in answer to his prayers. And so with the company of angels and saints, we sing the hymn of your praise, as without end we acclaim. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which firstly we, we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the world, together with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Leonard, our Bishop, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand down the Catholic and apostolic faith. Lord, remember your servants and all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you the sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them. For the redemption of their souls in hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John, and Paul, Cosmas, and Damian, and all your saints, we ask that through their merits and prayers and all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, 
graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father. Giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands. And once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and of Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed Passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts you've given us, the pure, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant, Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, almighty God, command that these gifts be brought by your hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants, who have gone before you, before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ in the place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants and those sinners, open your abundant mercies. Graciously grant some share in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon, through Christ our Lord. To whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
All glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and for my divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress. As we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity according to your will, who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word of God.
Let us pray. Make us who have been nourished by the sacred meal, Almighty God, always follow the example of blessed Michael in serving you with constant devotion and insisting all with untiring charity through Christ our Lord. My brothers and sisters, in the long process leading up to Father McGivney's beatification, I am a relatively late arrival on the scene, and I want to acknowledge my predecessors, Archbishops Cronin and Mansell, for all that they have done to further his cause. I also wish to thank those all associated with the Archdiocese of Hartford who have contributed along the way to this happy outcome. Special mention is also in order for those responsible for the postulation of Father McGivney's cause, especially Father Gabriel O'Donnell and Dr. Andrea Ambrosi. I dare say that Blessed Michael McGivney's memory would never have been preserved to the extent that it has, and his cause for beatification would not have been brought to fruition without the unfailing devotion, commitment, perseverance, and support of the Knights of Columbus. And for that, we in the Archdiocese, and indeed the whole Church, can be truly grateful. At a time of many challenges, we wish our brothers, the Knights, God's continued blessing and success in promoting the unity fraternity, charity, and patriotism that truly serve the spiritual, moral, and material good of all. We owe special thanks to the many people behind the scenes who have worked with great diligence and dedication on the planning of this beatification liturgy in difficult circumstances posed by the pandemic. The names of Mr. Stephen Filer and Fathers Matthew Gorick and Stephen Boguslawski come to mind as worthy of special mention for the leadership and coordination they have provided. Without the streaming of this liturgy over the internet, on television, and on radio, many people would have been deprived of witnessing this blessed event. I thank everyone at EWTN, along with their associates, including Catholic TV and Salt and Light Media, the Office of Radio and Television of the Archdiocese of Hartford, Peter Sonsky, and the countless men and women who have made these broadcasts possible. In conclusion, I invite you to join me in two daily prayers. First, that with Blessed Michael McGivney as our model, and at his intercession, many more men will heed God's call to serve as priests. And second, that at blessed Michael McGivney's intercession, we may be blessed with a further miracle leading to his canonization as a saint for the whole Church. And finally, let me repeat again my profound thanks to Cardinal Tobin for being here as the Holy Father's representative for his beautiful reflection with us in the homily, uh, for uh, Cardinals Dolan and O'Malley who have joined us, and so many other bishops and uh, from even other countries who have come for this very special occasion in the midst of ch the challenges and difficulties of travel today. We in the Archdiocese of Hartford are most grateful for your presence here today. And now I would invite uh, the Supreme Knight, Mr. Carl Anderson,
to say a few words of thanks and appreciation. die hard. On behalf of the two million brother knights of Columbus and their families around the world, I want to especially thank His Excellency Archbishop Leonard Blair and all those here at the Cathedral of St. Joseph for helping us arrive at this day. And I wish in particular to thank his predecessors, Archbishop Daniel Cronin, for helping us begin this journey, as well as Archbishop Henry Mansell. And of course, we are very grateful to our Supreme Chaplain, the Most Reverend William Laurie, Archbishop of Baltimore. We are thankful that despite the pandemic, so many Brother Knights among the hierarchy are with us, especially their eminences, Sean Cardinal O'Malley and Timothy Cardinal Dolan. And a special word of thanks to Archbishop Mutkretsky of Lviv, Ukraine, who has traveled the farthest uh, to be with us. Your presence, Excellency, reminds us of the more than 500,000 Brother Knights outside the United States and Canada, in the nations of the Philippines, Mexico, Cuba, Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania, Korea, and France. We are also very grateful for the dedication and professionalism of our postulators, Dr. Andrea Ambrosi, Father Gabriel O'Donnell, and Mr. Brian Caulfield. And we are especially thankful for the devotion of Father McGivney's family and for the faith of our miracle family, the Shackles. We are profoundly grateful to Pope Francis for giving Father McGivney the title of Blessed. We are especially thankful that His Eminence Joseph Cardinal Tobin is with us as the representative of our Holy Father, as well as our Apostolic Nuncio to the United States Archbishop Christophe Pierre. We believe it providential that Blessed Michael McGivney's beatification has occurred during the same month as the publication of the Pope's great encyclical on fraternity and social friendship, Fratelli Tutti, in which he writes, each day, we have to decide whether to be good Samaritans or indifferent bystanders. We know the decision Blessed Michael McGivney made, and we know the decision that millions of his brother knights have made following his example. This is truly a day the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad. Let us do so with the realization that the Lord has made this day as he has made each one of us for his purpose, to draw us closer to him so that we may more faithfully and more effectively serve him. Inspired by the example of blessed Michael McGivney, let us now go forward with a renewed spirit of charity so that we too may be a blessing to all those we meet. The Lord be with you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go forth, the Mass is ended.
the Cathedral of St. Joseph in Hartford, Connecticut. We've been watching the beatification mass of Father Michael McGivney with the presider, Arch uh, Joseph Cardinal Tobin of Newark. I'm Brian Patrick, along with Dr. Matthew Bunsen and Father Raymond D'Souza, Skyping with us from Ontario, Canada. Father, uh, Cardinal Tobin began his homily with the, uh, the talk of hope and encouragement. He ended with a call to action. God calls each one of us in our own day and in our own way. And he also talked about the role of the parish in the church and how Father McGivney used that to the fullest. I thought that was a very uh, good reminder from Cardinal Tobin because uh, he said the parish is where priests and the lay faithful collaborate in the middle of the world, where people live, where they work, where they raise their families. And often at beatifications and canonizations, we think of a new movement, a new religious order, some extraordinary moment in history. And what uh, Blessed Michael McGivney reminds us is that the daily work and life of the churches live for the most part in parishes. And he was a parish priest, and it's there that he animated the laity, that he collaborated with them, that he led them. And so in this case, uh, Cardinal Tobin reminds us that today is lifted up not